I heard the Lord say this word, and I've been releasing this word, and I feel like the Lord told me to release it here because I feel like as I release it in different regions, it awakens regions to the now what God's doing. So I want to prophesy over you this morning with what I believe God is saying over you, over me, and really over the church at this time. The Lord is raising up a company of people that he is calling the wild ones. They are the ones that have been marked with the spirit of Elijah and cry out like John the Baptist. Man-pleasing isn't a part of their mindset. They are not swayed by social protocols. They refuse to be seduced by modern-day rhetoric that doles one's conscience and convictions. They will walk in a radical faith, confronting a religious spirit wherever they go. They will step over fear, refusing to bow. They walk in a full dependency in Christ, for their cry is, is without him I am nothing. They've consecrated their eyes so their gaze is only looking to Jesus. They have a holy revolt in them towards anything that opposes Jesus and his truth. They do not care about their name being known. They are not oppressed by titles or worldly accomplishments. They are enamored only by Jesus, singular in their gaze, humble, repentant, fully surrendered, filled with an unwavering joy and an all-consuming peace. His mercy has marked them. His love has overtaken them. The world cannot break them, and the church desperately needs them. These are the wild ones. Are you a wild one in the house of God today? Are you a wild one in this hour for the Lord? I believe God is releasing the wild ones, and it's not a fleshly wildness. It's getting, un, it's getting undomesticated, where we become domesticated in our walk with Jesus, where we become professional in our worship and our adoration. God is wanting to break off the professionalism, and he's wanting us to get undomesticated. He's wanting us to, he's wanting a rattle and a rumble to come from the church right now. I believe it's not about volume. It's about a radical pursuit that God, I must must have an encounter with you. There must be a move of God. I cannot be satisfied with just a good service. I must have an outpouring of your spirit and your presence. I cannot go about my day without having the fresh manna for this hour. Lord, I don't want to be satisfied with the goodness and goodness of yesterday, but I have to have a fresh outpouring of today. I believe God is saying the wild ones will lead the charge for an insatiable appetite for the things of God. I believe this group is a group of wild ones. I believe this ministry has a calling for the wild ones. It's why he's shifting your location. It's even why he's sh- uh, shifting the, uh, the reach is maybe the best way to say it. Because he's going to gather a company of the wild ones. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6. And it says, look, I'm sending you the prophet Elijah. Before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives, his preaching will turn hearts of the father to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. And otherwise I will come and I will strike the land with a curse. The wild ones, in really simple terms, are the ones that will carry the spirit of Elijah. I'm here today to talk to you about what you're called to carry and what a spirit of Elijah will look like in your life. Because I believe as a wild one, we're going to operate in the spirit of Elijah. And we have to understand that the spirit of Elijah is actually a spiritual system that foreruns the moves of God. Before God shows up in a territory, the spirit of Elijah always precedes God. And Elijah is a prophetic and apostolic system that carries heaven's assignments. First assignment is one that prophesies what God is doing and what God is saying. And second, one that establishes God's dominion and his authority. So being one like you that carries the spirit of Elijah, you are called to shift and establish. Someone say shift 
and establish. That is what the spirit of Elijah is called to do. Every time there is rebellion in the land, come on America, come on nations of the world, the spirit of Elijah will rise up and usher in a move of genuine repentance and consecration. For the preachers in the room, have many of you felt led to talk about repentance and consecration? Because you are a forerunner for the spirit of Elijah. You are a wild one, and that is what the spirit of Elijah does. It calls forth consecration, and it calls forth a genuine move of repentance. Not a casual, oh, I'm sorry about that, God, but an actual divorcing of anything that would separate us from the wildness of what God has called us to walk in. Any, anything that is status quo, anything that is subpar, anything that dulls one's conscience and convictions, what I prophesied, right? The spirit of Elijah has an awakening anointing. And there's an awakening anointing that you're called to carry. Many people that carry the spirit of Elijah will find themselves drawn to areas of repentance and consecration in your own life, but you'll find yourself talking about it to people, loved ones, family, friends. Again, if you're a preacher, you're going to find yourself wanting to talk about it, minister about it. It's because it's what God is doing. He's cleansing the bride to be able to carry and steward the move of God that's coming. And that we're really at the beginning of. I feel like we're in the beginning stages of this awakening that is happening, this move of God. We're at this, the, the percolation has happened. We're at the kind of like phase one, if you want to put phase it on. That's a bit of a crass way to say it, but I hope you hear my heart. It's this beginning stage. And the spirit of Elijah is mandated to restore both the pattern and the ordinances of God. Now I'm going to break down what that looks like where the spirit of Elijah, in simple terms, brings order where there's disorder. So I don't know about you. Let's take it to our own lives. Who has felt compelled? This is just some personal inventory in your heart. You feel this need to declutter your life right now. It's because of what you carry. There's an increase of the spirit of Elijah upon your life. And all of a sudden, anything that feels out of order, it's, it's unacceptable. Can, can you relate to that? that and it's going gonna, it's gonna to manifest in the natural in your life. From cleaning out your emails, I know this sounds funny, to cleaning out the junk room, to the garage. I mean, it, it's, it's like getting your finances in order. It's like cleaning up those, dis, those miscommunications and relationships. That, that stuff that is discombobulated and it's out of order, you're like, I'm, I'm not, we're, we're done with that. There must be order and simplification. It's because it's the spirit of Elijah on you. You recognize where there's disorder and you recognize the need and the necessity of order in this hour. Some of you are actually going to bring order to your workplace. Some of you are going to help bring order to the church. You're going to bring order to societal issues. Some of you are advocates in this room. You carry a call of justice. It goes beyond the church. It hits major issues that your cities, your towns are facing. You're called to bring order. We see this in 1 Kings. I love this portion of scripture. It's probably one of my favorite portions of scripture because it's so bold. The prophet Elijah, we see him here, and he challenges King Ahab once and for all, and he says, who the nation of Israel is going to worship because it was out of order, and he says, we're no longer going to have a divided nation. Half of us are worshiping Baal, and half of us are worshiping Yahweh. We're done with that. We're going to decide today, once and for all, who this nation is going to worship. We're going to bring order where there's disorder. So the spirit of Elijah challenges King Ahab, and he says, meet me on Mount Carmel and bring all your false prophets and anyone that you want to bring, and, and let's meet there, and I will call on my God, you and all your false prophets, but he's saying all your people, you call on your God, and we'll see whose God responds. You know this story, right? And the, and the, and prophet Elijah said, whosoever God responds by fire, that's the God this nation will worship. What is he doing? He's bringing consecration. 
and he's bringing order where there's disorder. So he, the spirit of Elijah is in full effect, of course, on the prophet of Elijah. This is the first person that we see this spiritual system at work through is the prophet Elijah. So what happens? It's, an, it's a powerful story. So he says, you choose the altar you want. So he gave them their choice of real estate. Then he said, you can choose the time of day that you want to go. They said, we'll go first. Great. You get your time. You get your chronological best choice, your opinion of what you think is the best slot. He said, you can go as long as you want. You can do all the things you want to do to call on your God. So they chant, they sing, they cut themselves, they dance. They do everything they can do to entice their God to respond. They go from morning till it says early evening. Some theologians say late afternoon. So hours have gone by, and I love this. And this is where Elijah is gangster, and I love this because he's just bold. Like he does not care. He's like OG prophet. He's like, I've been in the cave. We going in. You tried to kill me. I'm here to establish. I'm sick of it. Like he got to the, I'm sick of it. And the wild ones have gotten to the place where they're sick of it. I, I really believe there has to come a point where you move in the spirit of Elijah because you get sick of it. And this is what we're seeing through the prophet Elijah. He's sick of it. He's sick of the disorder. He's sick of the dysfunction. He's sick of the deception. Right? He, he's sick of the wayward ways of the nation. He's sick of the blasphemy and the boldness from Jezebel and Ahab. He's like, I'm sick of it. Enough. He's like, I'm so sick of it. I'm going to put it all on the table. If your God responds, that's who we'll worship. Like, but of course he knows what's going to happen. Right? He knows. So I love this. In one translation it says that the prophet Elijah says, is your God out to, on a vacation? And then my personal favorite, is he out to the bathroom? Like I love it. That's gangster. I'm like, dang. Right? Right? I was Right, that is so beast mode, 100% accurate, right? That's just like, wow, you know? He's one person, and there's like 450 plus many more. He's so outnumbered in the natural, but he is, does not feel outnumbered. He's bold and he's confident because he knows he has the one, the one that only matters, Yahweh. In the natural in your life, you might feel outnumbered in a lot of ways. It might look like you're outnumbered. It might look like you're one to 450. But I want you to know, if you only have one plus one, Yahweh, you have the home court advantage. So as the story unfolds, he challenges them. Of course their God doesn't answer because their God is a false God. They've done all the things. And then Elijah does a very powerful act. And this is what you and I are called to do in the natural, but in the spirit as well. As they had been doing their chanting from morning till night, they had torn down the altar of the Lord that a prophet Elijah had built as well. There were two altars, one for the false prophet, or excuse me, for the false god Baal, and then one for Yahweh. They had torn down in all their hours of chanting all the things. So what did the prophet Elijah do? In operating as the spirit of Elijah does, he rebuilt the altar of the Lord. That was the first thing he did. He did not look, he did not challenge them in any way. He rebuilt the altar of the Lord. And that is a significant act because, friends, that is exactly what you and I are called to do. We are called to put God first and there is no other. We are called to restore order where there's been disorder. We're called to build back up what has been torn down. And so as he did this act, it models to you and I our assignment in this hour to rebuild what the enemy has torn down. So as he rebuilt it, I love this, he makes this, again, just this OG response, and he says, dig a trench around my altar. So they dug a trench, which, which is where water would go, and he says, get, you know, get a jar of water, actually probably a whole... Um, uh, yeah, a whole bunch of water. Maybe that's a bit, whole pitcher of water doesn't sound like enough. Cistern. There we go. That's probably better. A cistern of water. And they pour out one cistern. And he goes, bring another. Okay. They, they brought another. They pour it all over the sacrifice and the altar. Everything, right, is getting wet. This is the arch nemesis of fire. If you want to burn something on an altar, the last thing you would want it to be is wet. 
what is Elijah doing? He says, bring a third cistern and pour out the water. It is sopping wet by this time. He is, look, everyone is watching him. The nation of Israel is watching. The false prophets are watching. The king is watching. It is one against everyone. He has a sopping wet altar. And he calls on the name of Yahweh. And in one moment, fire comes down from heaven. And one translation says, and it licked up every ounce of water on the altar and the sacrifice. What does that display to us? It shows us that we do not need things to be perfectly in the right atmosphere for God to move. Things do not have to be just so or just right. And for those that might struggle with control, this is a word of encouragement for you. Be encouraged that things don't have to be just so or perfect for the type A personalities of the house. <laughs> guilty. Your speaker, guilty. I find this encouraging. It breaks striving off of us. It breaks worry and anxiety off of us. Because when things look dark, we can still call on God. And he comes down and he establishes. All he is looking for is the spirit of Elijah to call upon his name to establish the pattern and the ordinances of God. So for some of you that have felt like your home or your marriage or your children or the relationships with your children or fill in the blank, whatever it may be, the thing that is a challenge, uh, it would be your kryptonite, right? Whatever that kryptonite thing is, put it on the altar, cover it with the oil and light it on fire and watch God move. God doesn't need things to be just so. He is the home court advantage. <laughs> he is the deliverer. He is your provider. He is your healer. He is what you need in every single situation and circumstance in your life. So we see Elijah establish the spirit of Elijah first through him, but it's a picture that God removes, and I love this, Elijah was showing us to remove every single excuse that we have of needing things to be just so. Well, God isn't moving in my church, or God isn't moving in my region because the people are just not hungry. Well, you're hungry, so you cry out. People aren't serving God in my family. You are. You cry out. You change the atmosphere. You establish what God's doing. Do not underestimate the power of the spirit of Elijah operating through you, connecting with the promises in the spirit of God, and that convergence that happens in the spirit and how it manifests in the natural. Then we see, as we continue to read through scripture, talking about the spirit of Elijah, because I want you to have a handle and understanding of how the spirit of Elijah is played out in the word of God. Then the spirit of Elijah then comes on John the Baptist. In Luke 1, verses 13 through 17, it says, and this is Zacharias, I love this, he's a high priest, he's in the temple of the Lord, and he is having an encounter with the angel of the Lord who's telling him this word, it's powerful. It says, but the angel said to him, this is Zacharias, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. Someone say amen. amen. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Again, we see the spirit of Elijah at work through the mere conception of John the Baptist. Not even through his life that he lived on earth, but simply by him being in his mother's womb, he broke mindsets of unbelief. 
His mother was past what the medical community would say has the ability to bear children. They had prayed for years. They were righteous people, but they had not been able to have children. By the encounter of the angel of the Lord, a woman that is well beyond years and a man that is beyond years, they now are pregnant with a child. Do you know what that did to the community? Can you imagine? This is a per, per, predominant person, a prominent, excuse me, a prominent person in the community that has influence in the church at that time. And they're watching this man of God serve God, love God, lead his people, but they recognize that he's barren, his wife is barren. That is not so much the case now, but in those days, that was a place of shame. Because it was very much about inheritance and generational blessing and whatnot. It was very much the focus. And so, again, we don't have that today per se. But in those days, that was, a, that was a place of shame. And so what did God do? He went after what was a public shame. And he said, I do not need things to be what the medical community say they need to be. Come on, somebody. I do not need things to be just so in order for me to do my will. It's the same spirit of Elijah. It's just the details are different. It's what the prophet Elijah did in 1 Kings, but now we're seeing again in Luke through John the Baptist. The mere existence broke the spirit of unbelief among the people. It's the same spirit. When the spirit of Elijah is at work, it breaks unbelief. Who in this room, if you're honest, has been battling unbelief? You have felt an, an uptick and an increase in this area of warfare. Just raise your hand. So Jesus, all over this room, we break the sabotage of the enemy. We tell the enemy to silence his voice, for you have no authority, so shut up in Jesus' name. And we declare right now that the spirit of unbelief is broken, and it leaves right now off of people's minds, their hearts, their spirits, even their bodies. And there, where there has been agreement, we repent for agreement, and then we break agreement, and then we speak to the spirit of unbelief, and we say, get out and get off in Jesus' name. And now, Jesus, fill us with your faith. Faith. See, because you are called to operate in the spirit of Elijah, the enemy recognizes what you carry. And this is not to heighten what the enemy, I never want to heighten what the enemy is doing. But I also want to understand strategies at time because then I have strategies of breakthrough. So I wanted to call that out because I felt like as I was preaching, the Lord said, there are people in this room where you have felt so defeated You've been like, all those promises or the things you've been believing for that came so naturally before, you've been struggling with faith for those areas. And that unbelief has tried to creep in. That's because you carry the spirit of Elijah. And that's exactly what you're called to take out. So what you're called to take out has been coming after you. So your attack is prophesying to you. John the Baptist, again, I just want to, I want to hit this because I think this just has to hit our spirits this morning. This has to be absorbed into you this morning. His mere existence, it broke disappointment. All those years they were believing for a child. The grief, the pain, and in one moment God did it. We're in a moment, I believe, in a time with God where the Lord says years of disappointment will be removed in one moment. In one moment. So if you've had an area of your life, just raise your hand if that's you. If you have an area where there's been years. And you're okay. You love Jesus. You're still, it's all those things. But there's still like God's like, but that doesn't line up with who I am and my promise of your life. So Jesus, we break the disappointment and we call forth the blessing and the promise of God that's going to uproot disappointment and establish God's plans and purposes over your life in Jesus' name. And this is what I love. The spirit of Elijah, it redefines and restores how big God is. That is your assignment in this hour from the Lord as a wild one. <laughs> one that carries the spirit of Elijah, 
You are called to redefine and restore. Look at what John the Baptist did. Look what prophet Elijah did, operating through the spirit of Elijah. He redefined, they both redefined consistently how big God is. I heard the Lord say, probably, it was maybe last week, the days have blended together. It was probably about seven, nine days ago or so. I heard the Lord say this, and I shared this with my husband. I heard it so clear. It was like an inward, audible voice of the Lord. It came to me the strongest uh, prophetically that I've heard in a while. I mean, it came with such a boom internally for me. And he says, this is the time, this is a season of the church where I'm changing the, I am changing the narrative. We are in a changing the narrative season of the church. But that also applies to your life. How you've been known in one way, God, you will be redefined in this season. That's why I really, I felt that instantly when I walked in this house. I said, oh, they're in a metamorphosis. That's just another way to say you are in a redefining. Many of you personally are in a metamorphosis, in a redefining. The narrative, here it is, and this is what the Lord told me. This was the inward audible. It's like the Lord says, um, I'm changing the narrative. That was it. I'm changing the narrative over people, over regions, over cities, over nations, and you can certainly bring it to you very personally, but I felt like the Lord said on a very big scale and a small scale, very personal scale and a global scale, God says, I'm changing the narrative. We are in a redefining, and the spirit of Elijah and us that are called to walk and carry with the spirit of Elijah, this is our primary assignment, is to redefine what God is saying and doing in this hour. The spirit of Elijah, what I love, calls upon the supreme authority and sovereignty of God. The spirit of Elijah always calls on and understands the supreme authority. That is why when you operate with the spirit of Elijah, your faith is massive. Because you have a genuine revelation that God is so big, it genuinely does not matter what the natural looks like. My husband and I, we walked into the ICU three days ago, two days ago. A woman in our church, young woman, younger than myself, she's in ICU. They do not know what's going on. She's in a uh, medically induced coma. And I don't know about you. I, have been, I, was, a, I, was, a, I was a pastor for 11 years before I married Sean, and we shifted to itinerant. During my 11 years of pastoring, I went to many hospital rooms. And the same thing would happen every single time I went to hospital rooms. I felt very overwhelmed. My thoughts were discombobulated. I was looking at someone on their deathbed, and I just didn't really felt like I ever knew how to pray. It was this really weird thing that happened every time. Does anyone relate to that? You walk into very high crisis, and I just found myself, I mean, I would show up every time because I was like, I'm going to be there, but I just found myself like, just, I always had a hard time. This time was different. I heard the Lord says, you're walking in with the spirit of Elijah. And I was like, there we go. That's what I needed. And all of a sudden she's, you know, she has tubes everywhere. I mean, everything. And there was many people praying for her, not just Sean and I. Our church was praying for her. Her family's praying for her. Many people praying. But Sean and I go and we lay hands on her. We just started calling for it. And it was like, it was so clear. I was in the crisis. I was, I was facing someone in the natural. I mean, it looked hopeless. And there was nothing in me. I was so full of faith. I was so clear on how to pray. It was, it was so supernatural. And it was the spirit of Elijah operating out of Sean and I. And we just begin to prophesy and pray. She got transferred. She got transferred out of ICU later that afternoon. <laughs> Boom. I simply say that, and again, those were not just Sean and I's prayer. There was a collective company. We just happened to be the people that went and laid hands on her that day. But that was, I feel like, a company of people that had been interceding for her. And it was a result of that. But I can say I felt the spirit of Elijah arise within me. I took authority over what was out of order, and I called forth the order of the Lord. I, I, I broke the narrative of the enemy, and I declared the narrative of God. When we did that in the spirit, there was a shift in the natural. The Lord, I believe, is giving us strategy right now on how to shift things in the natural and how to do it in the spirit through the spirit of Elijah. Now, let me speak to John really quick because I want you to understand why John was a wild one 
and he was carrying the spirit of Elijah. And we really understand that he lived this way because he had been marked by God. He had been marked because the angel of the Lord visited, and obviously he was a supernatural conception through his mother and his father. But he lived a consecrated life because he had had a revelation of what God had spoken over him, and he never cared about his reputation. He did not care about his ego. We know that John the Baptist, I mean, he was wild, right? He lived a radical lifestyle. He lived a lifestyle that was in the wilderness. He was eating locusts and honey. He was wearing furs. I mean, the guy was what we could say eccentric. And yet he was marked with the spirit of Elijah and he understood his assignment. I heard the Lord say, even as I'm releasing this, this is the first time I've ever prophesied this over you guys. At times it will feel eccentric, but the Lord says, I've called you at times to do things that seem unusual, but it's to unlock the radical. That's over this house. And I felt like the Lord said, why would a man live like this? Why would John the Baptist live like this? The answer might be obvious, but we have to pull it apart. I think it's important we dissect it. It's because he was marked. When you get marked, that is when you live radical. When you get marked, that actually is what pulls the wildness out of you. When you live in the wilderness places, right, you experience a move of God, and it actually personally challenges, train, uh, changes, transforms you. That's when everything shifts. I look back at my own personal life, and I was marked again and again and again. And every single time I got marked, it made me more wild. Right? It made me more radical. Because when you encounter the reality of God, everything changes. And no longer do you find yourself needing the accolades of man or the affirmation of peer pressure or having to succumb to that to fit in. All of a sudden you're like, I'm okay if I look different. I'm supposed to look different. I understand that I'm salt and light. I'm actually supposed to live with the contrast. That revelation and being comfortable with who God's called you to be only happens when you've been marked. I re I'm reminded when I was a young girl, my, I was raised Catholic. And my family was in the Catholic church. I went to Catholic school, like the whole thing. Like we were Catholic Catholic. Like we weren't two times a year Catholic. We were like three, four times a week Catholic. Like we were, we were committed. And we had a reverence for God in our family. We had a reverence for God. We loved God. We, we really had a deep conviction as a family, a moral conviction, and we had a reverence for the Lord. But in the, and this was in the 80s, but in the late 60s, uh, the charismatic movement, the charismatic renewal began to happen in different Catholic churches. And then it went through the 70s and then the 80s. But it was probably early 80s by the time it hit the Catholic church I was in. So it had been going on for some years. And if you don't know that term, charismatic renewal, it simply means Holy Spirit blew open the doors of the Catholic church. And all of a sudden, my, my family, uh, a bunch of other families, even the priests were all speaking in tongues. And then the priest is calling healing services, and he has anointing services, and there's miracles that are happening. And we're all like, we know about Father God, and we know about Jesus, the Son, but who in the world is Holy Spirit, you know? We don't know about this one, but I like him. Like, this is amazing, you know? So it sent my family, this Catholic family, on a pilgrimage, spiritual pilgrimage. And I'm from southern Oregon, and, you know, we had a Volkswagen van. Like, we were so Oregon, like hardcore Oregon, right? And we were invited to this family camp. And it was like actual camping, no glamping. I mean, it was rustic, all the things. But we're this Catholic family. We, at the time, I had no grid between priest and pastor. I had no grid between Catholic and Foursquare and AG. And, like, I had no grid for anything. I just love God. Literally, I just was like, I love God. And that was how my family was. And they were like, do you guys want to come to this family camp? So they invite us to this family camp. My parents pile all of us kids in there. I'm the youngest of three girls. We do it like a nine-hour drive up north. It's north of Seattle, Smoky Point, Washington, random little place, but it had a huge, like, uh, retreat center. It was done by Foursquare, and they had kids, and they had junior high, high school combination services, adult services, so my family and I all split up. We all went to our assigned areas. I was in the kids. My sisters were in the junior high, which was combined with the high school, and my parents, of course, were in the adult services, and we all got massively impacted by God, and Holy Spirit was just moving at this camp in a radical way. I had never seen anything like this. But I do have to say where my encounter happened. We're at this, 
we're at our kind of campfire after, after services. This is probably second night in. And my parents are like, okay, so tell us about, like, what happened to your service, Krista. And I'm like, they let us stand on chairs. They had puppets. I sing at the top of my lungs. They let me be loud. It was amazing. <laughs> like, because in the Catholic Church, I got kicked out consistently because I laughed at everything. My, sisters, my sister and I would laugh super inappropriately, like, every single Sunday. And this was my mom. I'm not joking, because they didn't have kids service. Like, are you kidding? Like, everyone's in there, right? So my, sister, my mom, every Sunday, I'm not joking, would go, get out. And I'd be like this. <laughs> and I, my sister would start to make me laugh, and I would be like, is it worth it? And I was like, I'm going to get kicked out. And I was like, it's worth it. Yeah, it's worth it. Yeah, you know, as a kid, you're like weighing the cost. You're like weighing the consequences of this decision. And I remember thinking a good belly laugh is always worth it. Like, yeah, I'm down for it. So I, I don't know if I was in a lot of masses, but I was supposed to be in a lot of masses. But I was kicked out all the time for being loud. So I loved it because they told me I could be loud, sing songs, and stand on my chair. It was awesome, okay? My parents were like, God was moving. They were talking about how powerful theirs was. But then when my sisters began to share what happened at the junior high high school services, everything shifted for me. They started talking about people were on the floor. They were crying. Uh, they wouldn't have been able to articulate it like this, but now that I understand the terms, the, the prophetic was moving. People were being prophesied over. Deliverances were happening. Demons were being cast out. The move, like the spirit was just moving in these services, right? And I remember being like eight years old and being like, wait, hold on. Like, I'm talking about puppets and standing on a chair. You're not talking about that. You're talking about God's encountering people, like God's talking to people, like demons are getting cast out, people are getting set free, people are crying, like the love of God. Like, what are you talking, what? So I made a plan which felt really brave at eight years old. And it was to ask to go to the bathroom with no intention to go to the bathroom, with every intention to sprint across the field to go into their services, which is exactly what I did. As soon as I got to the door, I walked in the door. Again, I wouldn't have been able to articulate it. Now I understand what happened. I walked into the glory of the Lord. I didn't know. But at eight years old, this little Catholic girl that had no grid for anything, that on paper, this is why I have such issue with the seeker-sensitive movement. It's not that I'm anti-being seeker. I love being sensitive to the seeker. Be sensitive to the seekers, yes. But don't make a decision for the seekers. That's my issue, right? On paper, as a Catholic, they would have thought I would have hated it. I would have been uncomfortable. I would have wanted to leave. No, no, no. It was exactly what I needed. Just don't make a decision for someone. Show them the whole gospel. Let them decide. That's what I believe. I just show them the whole gospel. Let them make a decision. I'm eight years old. I shoved my little body against the back. The glory of the Lord. It's everything my sister said. People are on the floor weeping. God's prophesying. He's saying things over people. Like, I went, I went from this mentality of, like, God's our master, but I never saw his, like, his as my friend or my savior. Like, I didn't, I, knew, I had Jesus. It, you get it. I don't need to break that down. It was just, he was so personable. And at eight years old, I remember thinking, well, it marked me. If this is available, I will spend my life pursuing it. At eight years old, I got marked. We went back every single summer, five days out of my whole life. We stayed in the Catholic Church. I went to public school, wild, craziness all around me, craziness. And I was so marked by God. I didn't rebel. I didn't get caught up in all the junk because I had been marked by God. And it's not because I was more special than anyone. I had just stepped into the glory. And when you step into the glory, you get marked. When you step into the presence, you get marked. See, there must be marking and remarking. Every single summer, I went back, and I got remarked. And I just viewed myself like a missionary to my public high school and a missionary to my junior high and a missionary, you know, to my, my university years. Like, I didn't need things to be just so. I just needed God. Like, I, ju I just understood in my, in my simple understanding that if I could just get into the presence, that was enough to fuel me to be a missionary the rest of the week, the rest of the year. I didn't get Holy Spirit literally because the charismatic renewal kind of dissipated once we went back home. It was kind of this short little blip, but it marked us significantly. People are like, weren't you in this, like, radical church, Chris? No, no, We went back to, like, the stand-up sit-down. We went back to the very liturgical, very yawn, Chris to get out experience. I mean, <laughs> literally. Like, I, we didn't go back to that. I only got that five days a year. That is it for years until I was 19 years old. 
till I was 19 years old. All I got was five days a year. I did not know that summer camp was available every day. I did not know. I thought it literally only happened at camp. And the rest of my year, it was like just that. I just, I keep pulling on the, maybe the one word I received. Or I heard God say one thing to me in those five days. And I just stood on that all year. See, when you get marked, when you get marked, but imagine when you have a revelation that summer camp's available every day. You can get marked every day. And you realize, hold on, why am I living like this? Why am I satisfied with this when I can live like this? See, John the Baptist was radically marked, but he was marked again and again and again and again. Like it wasn't a one-time marking. For us to be mantled with the spirit of Elijah, we have to understand there's just three things I just want to hit. The lifestyle of the messenger must convey the weightiness of the message that they're carrying. To be mantled with the spirit of Elijah, you have to understand that your, your lifestyle, let me just say this in simple terms, your lifestyle must match the call of God on your life. That your lifestyle must convey the weightiness of the message that you're carrying. John lived a really intense lifestyle, didn't he? Locust, honey, fasted lifestyle. Like when he wasn't eating, right, he was fasting, obviously. And when he was eating, it was locusts and honey. That's radical, right? It's because he understood. He had to live a consecrated life. He could not look like the world that he was called to bring the spirit of Elijah to. He could not bring a new order if he matched what he was trying to rebuild. There had to be a contrast in his life. He had to look and sound different than the world around him. He understood he was not an echo. He really was a voice. He was not just a, a messenger. He was the message. So his life portrayed the message. Our lives must portray the message. There are few places that I feel like I could lose my salvation or my witness. Let me say it better. My witness. I don't think I can lose my salvation in Jesus' name. But my witness, and that is an airport. It is a challenging place to be sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. But I recognize as I travel and when unforeseen circumstances happen, which they happen often, I must have my lifestyle, the way I speak, the way I interact with people, what they walk away with after being with me has to be the same in the most frustrating of circumstances as in the best circumstances. That my lifestyle as a preacher and a minister has to be the same when I'm on the pulpit preaching as I am getting to the place I'm about to preach. You and what you carry has to be the same as you are on this, on the, as you gather in these services as you're driving home with the frustrated driver in front of you. The irritating co-worker the irritating family member. Your lifestyle must be marked with the spirit of Elijah because you cannot, you cannot afford to lose your witness when you have too much to carry. What you carry is too valuable and needed in this hour. We must understand our lifestyle on a very practical, simple level must match the call of God on our life. Our mouth must match our call. What we watch must match our call. The conversations we engage in must match our call. What we listen to must match our call. What we do with our bodies must match the call. Everything about us must match the call. Our lifestyle must carry the weight of our calling. We cannot live casually. We are truly called to steward what God has put on us 
And it is so key because we have so many people that want influence but have no consecration. They want a voice, but there has been no character. There are many people that walk in gifting but not anointing. And I don't know about you. When I'm in the trenches, I'm not looking for the gifting. I'm looking for the anointing. Because it's the anointing that breaks things. I'm looking for the person that has the limp. I'm looking for the person that has tarried with the Lord. I'm looking for the person that has wept and intercede. I'm looking for that. I'm not looking for the trendy, the cool. I'm not looking for the, the you know, the, the, the clickbait. I'm not looking for the tweetable moment. I'm looking for the anointing. I'm looking for the fruit. I'm looking for your character. That's what our world needs. That's what our cities needs. It's what our family needs. It's what our churches needs. Gangster, that's good. We live in a world that is constantly trying to domesticate your wildness. Right? Whether it's through busyness, it's hard to be wild when you're just slammed. <laughs> because when you're slammed, you're just trying to survive. You have to get out of survival in order to be wild. You have to get out of striving in order to be wild. You have to get out of man-pleasing in order to be wild. There's things that have come against us in this culture that have truly tried to domesticate us and even the American church. I'm going to speak to the American church, although it certainly goes beyond the American church. But if we are not careful, the Lord allowed the last few years of a global pandemic. He didn't do it, of course, but I do believe he's using it significantly. And he stripped us, and we needed to be stripped. He pulled the nonsense and the things that were not necessity, the stuff, the, the smoke and the lights and the, the good production. And he stripped it all down. And he says, who's actually just going to preach the gospel in their living room with an iPhone and just make it work? Who, who's still going to, you know, show up when it's maybe no one's really showing up? And who's still going to show up and just tarry and weep and stand in the gap and Who's going to get radical during this time? And I've watched us as a church. That's good. That will kind of help me shut up a little bit. That's good. That's good. It's hell. It's, it's help. I, I've watched this as a church in America in 2023. In 2022, we just felt like we were still in this stripped down version. But I've watched us very slowly start to go back to what we were before COVID. I've watched the production be put back together. I've watched the showmanship come back. I've watched the applause of the showmanship increase again. If we are not careful, the showmanship of America's church will rob us of the radicalness that we're called to in this hour. The spirit of Elijah cannot be hindered by a showmanship spirit. And there's a spirit of showmanship in America that the Lord is going after. And it's the wild ones that will confront it and break it. Because if we're not careful, if you do not have anointing, you will create a production to cover that. If you do not have the word of the Lord, you will allow the lights and the gifts, giftings, to cover what you haven't tarried for in the quiet place. And if we're not careful, a church will become satisfied and domesticated because this will feel like good enough because it's comfortable, it's familiar, it was good enough before. But the Lord says, I'm raising up the wild ones. And I look at history. 
I look at our history, I look at other people's history, and I think of the Catherine Coleman's, the Smith Wigglesworth, the John Knox, our favorite, we were just in Scotland, John Knox, favorite reformer. John Knox was one that Mary, Queen of Scots, said, I fear no one except for the prayers of John Knox. Peace mode. Where are the John Knox of today? We look at people like the Catherine Coleman Smith Wigglesworth. We could go on and on, whatever, fill in the blank of the people that historically, the, the generals of the faith, the Hall of Famers, the Hebrews 11 peeps, you know, that you read through and you're like, oh, my gosh. But look at the life they lived. We want influence and we want to be used by God, but we're not willing to live that life. There's a consecration. There's a radicalness that God is inviting the ones that are called to carry the spirit of Elijah in this hour. Number two. The wilderness that you've been in, I think we could go around and I, there's probably a lot of you, and you could show your, just by raising your hand, you feel like you've been in some extended wilderness seasons. I'm raising my hand with you. It's been a challenging season in some ways. But your wilderness, I heard the Lord say this, but your wilderness is what will produce your wildness. Luke 180 said John grew up and became strong in spirit and he lived in the wilderness until he began his public ministry to Israel. Why is this important? Because there's a focus that comes in the wilderness, right? When you're in the wilderness seasons of your life, everything gets stripped back. Clarity comes. It becomes very clear because it's just you and Jesus. Like you don't have anything else. People's opinions, they're not getting you out of the wilderness. You're like, I don't care about that anymore. What you used to care about, all the nonsense, all the fluff, all the shiny things. All of a sudden, when you're in the extended seasons, where you're in the grit places, where you're just like leaning into God, and you're just like, it's all, it's just you and me, Jesus. Like, people's words aren't helping me. Like, the counseling's not helping. This isn't helping. The whatever, you fill in the blank. Everything you've tried to find the peace, try to find the anchors, but it has not sufficed. It hasn't satisfied. It's just you and God. All of a sudden you're in this wilderness. All of a sudden God begins to minister to you, heal you, deliver you, set you free. So that when you come out of the wilderness, all of a sudden you're very clear on who you are. Because God has defined you in the wilderness. The wilderness is our necess necessary for the John the Baptist. John the Baptist isn't who he is without the wildernesses. You are not who you are without the wildernesses. We keep wanting to get out of the wildernesses, but God says, I'm actually using them to forge you, to fashion you for what you carry. His voice was so clear. It was so piercing. It shook realms open when he preached. John the Baptist brought the word of the Lord and all of a sudden the hardest of hearts were like, I must be saved. That only happened because he allowed himself to be fashioned in the hard places with nothing of comfort around him, but everything of him was leaning on the presence of God, saying, I have nothing without you, God. And he found himself being used so strategically. He was the one who baptized the Messiah. He was the one who was assigned to prepare the planet for the greatest move of God, Jesus. What a weight. But he understood the weight. And he stayed in the wilderness until the Lord released him. I prophesy this over you today. Stay in the place that God has you in, even if it's uncomfortable until he releases you because the Lord is fashioning you for this hour. The wildernesses are what produce your authority. John the Baptist would have not had that authority had he not been in the wilderness. And let me end with this. The wild ones you will look different. You're supposed to look different. Man-pleasing is not a part of your mindset when you're a wild one. Elijah's, the spirit of Elijah looked different on John the Baptist than it did on the prophet Elijah. And I want you to catch this. When you read in Scripture, 
the prophet Elijah, we see him doing a lot of miracles, raising the dead. But when you study John the Baptist, you don't see so much the miracles. What you see is him raising a dead nation. In this hour, the spirit of Elijah that you and I are called upon is going from a man that comes by the spirit. And it was on prophet Elijah. It was on John the Baptist. It's now coming on a generation where it came upon a person in scripture. It's now coming upon a company of people. I want you to stand right now. We're in an hour where I believe God is saying the weight let me, let me say this better. The revelation of the weight that you carry is coming upon you. In this room right now, I heard the Lord say, I'm going to begin to show you actually the weight of what you carry. Some of you have actually not seen how significant you are. You have not understood just how much authority and anointing you're called to carry. So you've been living casually. But today, the Lord's going to actually show you your call and what you're called to carry. It's going to change the way you see yourself, and therefore it's going to change the way you live. And I'm not talking about moral issues per se, although that if that applies to you, let's deal with that. But I'm actually calling it from a deeper place. I'm speaking right now to the people where on a moral level... You're in alignment. But on a spiritual level, God is saying, I need you to get that tenacious hunger once again. That insatiable appetite for the things of God again. Where life has doled you down, God is sharpening you right now. And you're going to see your call. So close your eyes all over this room. And the Lord is going to begin to show you. I just feel like a revelation is going to begin to hit. Like some of you, you have yourself pigeonholed. You're like, this is who I am. This is what I do. And God's like, no. This is who I say you are. I heard the Lord say, society often defines us by our chronological age. So we have boundaries in the sense of we think God can use me during these years or those were my prime years. And I just heard the Lord says, I'm redefining. Come on, we're in the redefine. I'm redefining how you view this season of your life and the age range that you see yourself in. Because society has told you that during this time in your life, whatever that may be, this age range of your life, your life is to look like this. I want to break that box off of you. And I want to declare the freedom to be who God has called you to be. Remember, God is changing the narrative. God is changing the narratives of what 60s look like, of what 70s look like, of what 50s look like. We break off that mentality of, this is my time for the sidelines. I'm on the final chapters when I'm in my 70s, my 80s, or my 90s. No, no. What, what if you were actually just getting started? What if actually all those years of experience and wisdom, the greatest impact of your ministry was in the latter part versus the beginning of your life? But it was with the intention because of the authority that you now walk in. Shift the way you think. Remember, the spirit of Elijah shifts and then it establishes. Allow your mind to be shifted of how you see yourself right now. So Lord, right now, I thank you. All over this room, you are breaking off a false belief system that has been a learned 
behavior, a learned belief system through our natural society of telling us what our life should look like at certain ages. I break it off and we declare fresh start, clean slate. Fresh start, clean slate. 